Hey, Dalio is here. We, we will talk about the markets, but I want to start with the culture, because that's what uh, I wanted to have you here to talk about. Um, you know, you do something that is very, very different than most other companies, firms, places, uh, which is you believe in this radical transparency idea. Right? It's almost, it is almost ruthless to some extent. And I wanted to try just for everybody here to understand how you got to that place and what it is that you do. You tape record conversations. You show people. You'll, you'll, you'll tell them. Everyone tells each other exactly what they think and, and how that works and, and, and specifically how it came to be. Uh, well, I started trading markets when I was a kid, about 12. And early on in the markets, you know that you're, there's a high probability you're going to be wrong, no matter how confident you are. So I liked to look for people who had alternative point of views, different point of views, people who would disagree with me. And I wanted to see their thinking, because it improved my chances of being right. And so I learned that um, besides proving the decision making, I learned a lot from the other people who disagreed, what was their perspective. I think we're all blind in many different ways. And then, um, so then I started to have other people work with me. And I'd say, like, how, we, how do you want to be with each other? How do you want to be with me? How should I be with you? Would you want me to tell you what I think? Do I want to hear what you think? Or do I want you to filter that? And it just seemed so obvious, because um, it, it didn't even seem ethical to not to have critical thoughts about people and not to discuss it. It didn't give them a chance to share their perspective. So in other words, our goal is to just try to find out what's true. In my business, um, I have to be an independent thinker. And each of the people I work with has to be an independent thinker. Because the consensus is built into the price. So you have to think, where's the consensus wrong? And you don't know whether that you're going to be right or wrong. And so if you're going to have independent thinkers operate that way, and you want to encourage that, you want to be able to have thoughtful conversations. And what's so crazy, isn't it totally crazy not to be able to be that way? To be in an organization in which, let me ask you a question, would you rather know what people are thinking or would you rather not know what they're thinking? Would you rather be able to express what Depends you're thinking? what they're thinking. Okay, but you see what's actually happening in your mind, and it's physiological, is that Think of it as that there are two different minds going on. Uh, and your, your brain, physiologically, has different brains operating in it. There's, a, there's the part of your brain which is called the prefrontal cortex, which is that part of the brain that is thoughtful and, and engineers what you want and how should you be. And then there's parts of your brain which are the animal brain that, is, uh, that you've been born with, and particularly the amygdala. There's this part of the brain, which is the fight or flight. And so when you answer the question, you're largely answering the question as though it's you in, in aggregate. But if you really start to think about it and I say, what do you want? Your higher level brain would say, I would like to find out uh, what you think. I'd like to find out what I'd like to be able to express what I think. And I'd like to be able to have a thoughtful examination of whether it's true or not. Because logically, that's the smart thing to do. So intellectually, everybody gets it. The only re emotional reactions that they have is that other part of the brain that makes it uncomfortable. And I think our society has reinforced that so much. And that's why you have such inefficient decision making, in incredibly right. inefficient, like, like all the different people who think that something is wrong. And what do they do? They can't express it. They can't talk about it. They can't examine it. Um, so you have very inefficient de decision making and lack of honesty, office politics. So what we have is transparency. like so. Yes, everything is taped so that everybody can hear every conversation. The only conversations that we don't have taped are those that might, if we have a proprietary trade or, or if we're having some personal issue that is not related to the business, a health issue, and so we don't tape that. But every tape of everybody is, everybody's conversations are taped and everybody can listen to. Now, that's very shocking, um, but it means that everybody doesn't have spin. There's no spin. You could form your own opinions. It builds trust. It's fantastic. <laughs> how, <o> how often <laughs> do you feel uncomfortable on any given day? Um, I'm made comfortable by it. What makes me uncomfortable is when we don't know such things. And we, we describe the process. Most people are like this. There's about an 18-month adjustment process, which you would call sort of getting to the other side, in which there's when a When you come to your firm. When you come to the firm, 
people, uh, before they come to the firm, they intellectually say, yes, that's right. I would like to know what my strengths and weaknesses are. I want to be able to speak up about anything if I don't think it's right. I want to be able to make sense of anything. I want to have that total freedom. So they want it intellectually. And we show them the tapes of what it's like, because we got a lot of tapes to show. <laughs> so we show them the tapes of what it's like, and they say, yeah, I want that. But they're not used to it yet. So much of what we do is, is habit. Habit comes from a part of the brain, basal ganglia. There's this habit. And you have to get used to it. And, then we, and it takes about an 18-month period on average to go through a process that we are being able to operate that way. But it's a culture that operates that way, and so it's self-reinforcing. It becomes like mistakes. Mistakes are good things. Mistakes are good things, meaning if they're made in learning. In other words, so mistakes are how we learn, because mistakes produce pain. And if you produce that and you convert that to learning, um, like, for example, punishing people for mistakes um, is bad, because they hide things. Uh, where if you were to say to your kid and they, who makes a, a mistake, uh, the only thing you have to do is tell me what would you have done different in the future, and then we'll be good, that learns, makes that a learning process. Or weaknesses. Everybody has a weaknesses, ha has a number of weaknesses. The great people that I've seen um, in almost any area always have weaknesses. They just have known what their weaknesses are and have ways of getting around those weaknesses. So everybody feels really good about that, and after 18 months or so, they can't imagine working in another place. How, what percentage of people come to your, your office thinking this is a good idea, and they can't get through the, next, the 18 months? Um, 35, about 35% 35 of them uh, don't get through the 18 months for one reason or another. I mean, it's either the cultural thing. Everybody has a challenge during that period. About, uh, and, they, and their two brains wrestle with each other. Um, what I mean that their upper level brain always is saying, okay, this process is good and it's healthy and so on. And the lower level them says, <clears throat> it's difficult. And they wrestle, and that wrestling match, so about 35% are gone in, in the first 18 months or so. And, but 50% of the population who worked there 10 years ago, ago still works there and wouldn't work anywhere else because they can't imagine going into an organization in which there's not that tra transparency. Do, how frequently do you listen to the tapes? How, how often do you actually go back to these tapes? People freely go back to the tapes all the time. They, they go back to the tapes and it's so to, that to they hold, can hear it's to what- to hold you accountable to say, you, we were at a meeting two, two weeks ago, you said X, now you're saying Y, let me show you what you said. I mean, is, well, is, like, a, is it like a video replay? Well, that's, I mean, it, no, it's mostly also to get exposure to what's going on. So. Um, for example, because there's no spin in the company, I mean, can you imagine what, we're talking about General Motors, can you imagine, wouldn't you love to see those tapes? <laughs> I mean, of, of, of it going through what it went through and the people operating that way? Okay, so now you're a General Motors employee going through that and you could see all of that. And then there's open discussion about all of that. Okay, so it's, it's definitely different, but it, it, it means that there's no spin and you can't hold them. So people look at it to try to say what's really going on, either for the company as a whole or for them as individuals. Because like if they're talked about, they'd like to know. What, 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 so there's an, uh, you can't talk behind anybody's back. So for example, they either are called up and put into the meeting or that they see the tape. So if I was talking, usual company, you know, two bosses sit down and they say, um, I think uh, Bob is doing you know, a pretty lousy job. Da, 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 da. And then they call him in and they say, hey, Bob. You know, and he comes in and then they give him some kind of spin thing and then he goes out and they don't have a quality conversation. Well, here you get to see that stuff. So you know that there's real honesty. You know, there's, there's um, one sentence that I try to describe Bridgewater by and it's um, meaningful work and meaningful relationships. I, this is what I want, meaningful work and meaningful relationships through radical truth and radical transparency. So meaningful work means like we're in a mission together, we're excited about what we do, we want to do it excellently, that's meaningful work. Meaningful relationships are these relationships in where there's, you know, like the honesty helps you. You can argue things through, but you always know that there's honesty and that there's mutual caring for each other. Radical truth means that knowing what is true, to be able to deal with reality, 
whether you like the reality or not, but to know what reality is. Like, do you have, imagine if you had a disease, would you want to know that you had that disease or would you want not want to know? I'd want to know. And so to know, do you, if you have a weakness, do you want to know you have the weakness or do you not want to know? Radical truth and radical transparency means you get to see everything. That's very powerful. And it's particularly pow powerful even in this day and age. I believe that everything works like a machine. So when, I, when we talk about markets, when we talk about economics, you know how I think it's just a machine. Co everything has cause-effect relationships. And you can program all of that. We're machines. The human brain's a machine. And we operate that way. And in today's age, we have data. We have a lot of data. And so to be able to look at what people are like is a powerful thing. When I, when I hear the interview of, about General Motors, and you think about one country, one company or another, you, you think of Tesla, and by contrast, OK, look, there are two things that make a difference. It's either people or culture, OK? And that's everything. And so everybody's talking about this was done or that was done. Step back. What were your people like? How are they different? What is your culture like, and how is that different? And that's all that matters. And so if you look at it that way and you compare what the future of General Motors is going to be and the future of Tesla is going to be or any such things, that's what all that makes up the difference. And you can put data together that shows that and you can operate in that way and that's what makes you effective. How often do you meet a really tremendously talented person that you'd love to have in your organization but you know they just won't work? Oh, you know, fair amount, lots of amount. And we won't compromise that. Because it's like compromising being truthful with each other. And when you say truthful, by the way. Truthful I, being, I mean, in right. other words, open. People are open. How open are they? I mean, I know they are blunt, but are we talking, I mean, are people adding adjectives to how blunt? I mean, are people just really, I mean, if we were to have a, a beer and talk about, you know, Charlie, whoever Charlie is, and we said, would, you would have the exact same conversation in front exactly. of Exactly. Exactly. And you get used to it. And you get to like it and appreciate it. Sounds very far. How often, though, are people's feelings very hurt? They're not? They're not hurt. Is this applicable? Well, when I say they're not hurt, there's initially uh, a, an emotional reaction. There's a part of the brain that's amygdala, and it's the same thing that's a fight or flight. And what usually happens in that moment <laughs> is that there's an emotional reaction quite often, and that emotional reaction fades. And so if you give it an hour or two, particularly if you can right. see yourself in the meeting and so on, and you know that you're not trying to hurt people. Because let's say if you were trying to hurt people, that would become apparent in the tape. So are you trying to help people? We're, we're trying to help each other. But that means we just disagree. Right. We see things different. Why, couldn't, why can't we civilly disagree? Isn't it a perversity of our society that people can't thoughtfully disagree? I mean, you go into a, you, go, you and I go to a restaurant. Somebody says, I like the food. The next person's reluctant to say, I don't like the food. That's weird, right? You sh there's an aversion to disagreement. Thoughtful disagreement, when, when two thoughtful people who are intelligent disagree, that's when the power of understanding begins. Because they can then say, why do they disagree? And work themselves through it to make progress. And so it's a healthy thing. But what happens if one guy thinks he's smarter than the other guy? Well, they get to find out. <laughs> And smarter, what you find out is different people are smart in different ways. So um, by the way, you get to find out how people are different, remarkably different ways. Right. Some people are creative and not reliable. Some people are reliable but not creative. Some people are meticulous. Some people are big picture thinkers. In order to be effective, you find that there is, people are smart in very different ways. So the creative And there's an appreciation of those differences because you, then when you realize that you, that, like, you need it all. And in order to have an effective group, you need a detailed thinker, and you need a big picture thinker, you need the creative so the and the big, reliable. So the, the big picture thinker who's, who's unreliable, you say to him, we just know you're unreliable. It becomes so, uh, it becomes <laughs> so apparent. But we love you so much because you're a big thinker. So we'll That's, that, in other words, right, you can play that role. Nice. Okay. You can play that role. Let's not pretend, OK? OK, if you're, a, if you're very creative, this is often the case, a very creative person is not reliable. A big picture thinker is not detailed thinker. These, this is the way. Right. And so they're all valuable, but you, you can make a team better. There's also mutual understanding and appreciation. In other words, I can appreciate things 
that in the past I would have been very annoyed at because I think, for God's sakes, can't right. you see it? And, that, and, and I'm not realizing, you know, so there's an appreciation for that and the right. team. And there's an effect, there's an effectiveness to it. What do your lawyers think of all these tape recordings? Uh, you, you know, it was, it was so interesting because uh, like the lawyers, when we started to do this said, you're absolutely crazy to do this because all of this, there's this all pile of evidence and, and so on. And, and um, so uh, every now and then you can get, um, you know, a frivolous lawsuit. And what, what, what I found out is, look, if we're doing something wrong, uh, I'd want to know about it. It's on tape. And what I found out is I, I think in the whole existence of Bridgewater, um, and now that's be 40 years, I think I've had only about three frivolous lawsuits. And uh, because the people in that actually can't make up a story. They are, so we have the tapes. And in all of those cases, all we did is give the tapes to the arbitrator or whoever is dealing with it to take a look at. And but when you do that, so we don't have lawsuits. We don't have, if there's something to hide and you're doing it wrong, fine. Most lawsuits come because people are making accusations and they're trying to recreate right. what happened. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing, right? This is good. So we might make mistakes, but. Right. I want to open up for questions, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, just where are you, uh, totally on a different subject, which is where, just where are you on the market so we know? We just have Lloyd Blankfein in here who uh, seemed, seemed relatively bullish on where, where the world was headed. Are you? Again, I, I, I want to just take a minute on the machine that gets me to where I am, okay? Um, when we have a lot of, when there's an upward debt cycle and there's a lowering of interest rates, it reduces debt service payments. When interest rates hit zero and there are large credit spreads, you can no longer have monetary policy as an interest rate driven, you have uh, quantitative easing. When you, um, when there's the purchases of those assets, it causes those purchases, it causes the, those returns to go down, expected returns to go out down, and it causes asset prices to rise. And that's been the transmission mechanism through there. Now we have a situation in the United States to some extent, in Europe to a complete extent, and to Japan in a complete extent, where there are both zero interest rates and basically zero spreads. That means that the effectiveness of monetary policy will be less going forward. We're in, we're in a mid part of a cycle, and this is an easy part, good part of the cycle. As time progresses, let's say in a year or two, whenever there might be a need for easing of monetary policy, we're going to be in a situation in which the effective ability to ease is very limited. And that'll be at the same time, that's at the same time as asset prices will be comparatively high because of the fact of pushing them up and the spreads down. So it's now, I think it's, I think it's a good environment. We are long at equities and we are, and we are holding those positions and, and it's a relatively good time. What I worry about is if we were to take it a year or two in the future, what the effectiveness of monetary policy will be, particularly in a deflationary environment. And, we will, and when I say deflationary environment, we have been in a secular declining inflation, declining interest rate uh, move. Since 1980, every cyclical peak and every cyclical trough in interest rates has been lower than the one below, before it until we hit zero interest rates. So there is a force, it won't take too much time to describe, but there is a big deflationary force and when we're at zero, that day will come in terms of those deflationary pressures we're seeing it in oil and such things. So it is that concern at that point that I think, I think it'll be a big difference in the world, world economy. So we are almost at the end of the ability to squeeze more out of it. And when I, if you look at capitalism, it's, it's the spread that is the transmission mechanism Everybody's looking for spread, and it's that spread that is the transition mechanism that makes lending and that go through, and then there's lowering interest rates and lowers debt service payments. That dynamic, which capitalism is based on, is going to become decreasingly effective in the, um, not immediate, but longer term future. I could talk to you forever. Let's open it up, though, just so we can get a couple, a couple questions uh, for Ray. 
uh, if you have a hand, uh, please, uh, please just throw, throw your hand up. I see the professor has another, but we have a, we have a question back there. Yeah. Well, we make them relevant. We, we, we have systems, um, you know, how, how you push the buttons and so on. But we make them uh, available for everybody in kind of a library, so it depends what ones you want to go get. And then we tag them whenever anybody's discussed so that the person will know. Um, we are now um, the next technology, which hasn't yet been introduced but will be in the next moment, uh, next few months, is to be able to push each point on the tape so that you can know what is at that point in the tape that becomes relevant and it becomes indexed. Yeah. I watched your how the economic machine works on YouTube. I watched your uh, YouTube video, how the economic machine works, and I think it's fabulous. What can we do for you know school school age children to enhance their understanding of the economic machine, as you as you put it? Um, by the way, I did that as much for. The average per, as much for policymakers as I did it for, because one of the things I found is that policymakers don't pay as much attention to the machine like printing money. Is printing, the biggest question today, is printing money inflationary? Is it a bad thing or not? And, that, and I just wanted to make clear in that notion that if you spend money or you spend credit, and spending is the demand side, and quantity is the uh, supply side. And if you have less credit and you have more money and spending is the same, it works that way. If we can agree on such things, then like in Europe today, that policymakers, if they can agree that the machine works that way, we could know then how to best approach it. And so it's, it's all very simple. I think that um, what we can do for kids or we can do for others, is to simplify. That, um, I, I don't know who, was, who it was who said that any damn fool can make it complicated. It takes a genius to make it simple. Essentially, the, in 30 minutes, I think that's, I tried to convey everything that matters that I know in 30 minutes in the, how the economic machine works. And I think if we go back to that basic, simple level and we start there, it's like math, you know? When you're taught, um, what does um, 12, times 35 equal. And you can do that in a complicated way. Or you could do it in a simple way that you might say, let's round 12 to 10, and let's round 35 to 40, and it's about 400. And that, you can do it, if we simplify that and deal with the basics, I think it's, it's, it's helpful. Let's sneak in one final question, Jacob. Uh, what are some of your own shortcomings that you've learned about from watching the tapes? Oh, I'm, I'm, I got a laundry list. I'm, um, first of all, I have a terrible rote memory. Um, I, I'm, I'm very unreliable. Um, <laughs> um, I, I really, I, I'm, I'm incredibly uh, forgetful. I need people around who will um, take care of a lot of things that I'm, uh, for me. In other words, I need handlers. Um, <laughs> and people who are meticulous and organized and um, those are my, you know, those are the, the major. I miss, by the way, I mean, like, at any time, I believe that I'm missing a lot. Uh, like, I look at, the, there's so many things that I'm not seeing. The one thing that's good about that is that I know that I'm not seeing them. And so that's why I keep going to other people who I, who I find see differently. And that's my biggest advantage. My biggest advantage is not what I know. What I know is a small percentage of what I need to know. My biggest advantage is that I know that I don't know a lot, and I'm worried about not knowing, and that I know how to speak to people who might know a lot, and then I and do have that process. And then through that, I learn a lot, and I minimize my chances of uh, harming myself because I don't know. You are reliable for a very great conversation. Thank you, Thank Dalio. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.